When I heard Wes and Phil speak uh, last year, one of the things that really ticked me off was uh, about this whole water issue, and Phil's gonna cover this water issue to the point where you're gonna be pretty angry. One of the things that angered me is that as an organic gardener in my backyard, I can't collect rainwater off of my roof to water my little organic garden, because that's illegal, but that these folks can destroy literally millions and millions of gallons of water per well, and that really ticked me off. Um, I also wanted to give you a quick quote. Uh, this is a quote by a journalist and a nonviolent activist who was hung by his own government uh, back in 1995 for being outspoken against Shell Oil. Uh, he wrote, the environment is man's first right. Without a clean environment, man cannot exist to claim other rights, be they political, social, or economic. I thought that was pretty, pretty good. He got hung for that. So um, it is on the back of a little tiny little flyer that's on the back table there. If you want to watch this presentation or if someone you know didn't get to come tonight to the presentation, uh, the link to the YouTube uh, uh, channel is on the back of this little quote on the back table. So be sure to pick one of those up on your way out. Um, so I get uh, the opportunity to, to uh, uh, welcome Phil Doe. Uh, Phil has been fighting for Colorado water for most of his adult life at the Department of the Interior Bureau of Reclamation. He was the head of the Bureau's office for the administration of federal water law. And in that capacity, he was featured as a whistleblower on 60 Minutes. He also served as the agency's environmental compliance officer. Uh, he is a former professor of English literature at uh, DU and School of Mines. He has published op-ed features in Rocky Mountain News, Denver Post, Colorado Central Magazine, and Counterpunch. His past grassroots, grassroots efforts opposed the Animus Las Plata water project in southwest Colorado. He is a registered citizen lobbyist at the state capitol and testifies at the federal and state legislative level on natural resource issues. He serves on the board of the grassroots group Be the Change and directs their environmental issues program with a current focus on hydraulic fracturing. Please welcome Phil Doe. Jack started with a poem. I could do the owl and the pussycat, but it probably isn't appropriate to the situation at hand. Let me give you a couple lines from the English poet W.H. Auden, the 20th century poet. He said, thousands of people have lived without love but nobody has lived without water. So you should all be concerned about where your water is going, because in this state, the water belongs to you. Black letter law in the Constitution. It doesn't belong to the state. It doesn't belong to anyone else but you. So you should protect it. There's been a tremendous effort to take it away from you, but the Constitution still says it belongs to you. Before I get into water, I want to talk about how massive an undertaking we are all facing in the near future from fracking. How many of you know how many square miles there are in this state? Any idea? About 104,000 square miles. What do you think the oil and gas industry owns? When I say own, a lease by the oil and gas industry is tantamount to ownership. How much do you think the oil and gas industry controls in this state already? 20,000 square miles. That's a landmass loss larger than nine states, and it rivals the size of West Virginia. Another surprise. How many environmental studies, how many social studies, how many economic studies have been done to evaluate what this might mean to our environment and to our social and economic well-being? How many have been done? Zippo. How many are planned? Zippo, we need to change that. It's very and very important that we do because perhaps 60 to 70 percent of the state is underlain by these shale formations that Wes talked about. So theoretically, 80,000 square miles of the state could be an oil and gas patch. Now comes, the, if that isn't alarming enough, I mean, it's major industrialization of the state, even at 20,000 square miles. And we, we had to back into this. The state doesn't track this. Be the change did it. We went to the, the feds and the state and found out that they have about nine, and this was a year ago, 9,000 square miles under lease to the oil and gas industry. We also know, and you could tell by those, by those pictures of where the oil and gas wells are, 
that more land is owned privately. But the state doesn't track that. They have no idea how much land is leased. We just ginned up the number that it was at least as large as the state and federal land. So that's how we came up with 20,000 20, square miles. And it could be much more than that. It could be. But they're not tracking. I mean, that's just an abdication of public responsibility. <coughs> not only because of the wildlife impacts and the air impacts and all those other impacts you get with high industrial activity, there's the water impact, which is major. Let's look at one horizontal well, and this is where all the activity is going to be. One horizontal well takes five million gallons of water. That's enough water for the domestic needs of 150 people for a year. That's one well. Usually in horizontal fracking, they'll put about eight wells on a pad. They'll take an area of 10 to 15 acres within a section, 640, one square mile, let's keep it in the same increments of measurement, one square mile, they'll put eight, a 10 acre pad out there, they'll put eight wells in, and each well takes five million gallons of water. And that's just the first time. And they'll come back again and again and again, we believe, because that's the practice on vertical wells. And each time it takes a little more. To do this for one well, it'll probably take two or three months. 24-7. Because of the load limits in this state, it'll take a thousand truckloads of water. 500 in, 500 empties out. It'll take 40 tons of sand and chemicals. The industry's fond of saying, well, the chemicals aren't much, it's less than 1%. Well, 1% one, one of 5 million gallons is a lot of, you know, is a lot of chemicals. That's 50,000 gallons of chemicals. So, I mean, this is what you're looking at. I mean, it's a, and they'll be out there all the time, back and forth and back with you know, those clay lights. I mean, they never stop. And if it takes two to three for one, they could be out there a year longer for eight. And that's in your backyard, because as the rules now stand, it's 350 feet away. Uh, the state and its magnanimity is going to, you know, maybe make it 300 feet, which has nothing to do with public safety. As that, that man that now runs the COGCC that Hickenlooper promoted, he says, well, it's only for this, the issues, to conquer the issues of nuisance and dust. They are still not looking at what this means to public health. So back to water. If we have, 20,000 square miles of land under lease, and they put, can put eight wells in each of those sections. Think of the water. Now, the difference between hydraulic fracturing and any other water use is that when they use it, they destroy it. So that five million gallons, or 40 million gallons on that one well pad, is gone forever. They have to bury it. They bury it in class two wells. And it's, it's not only the use that you have to be concerned about, which we don't have. Our rivers are overappropriated. All the rivers on the Front Range are overappropriated. I'll get to that in a second. But it's what are they gonna do with the waste? And we don't even know what's in the waste because we don't have to measure it. The EPA in its infinite wisdom decided that this stuff would never get back to the, to the surface again. So they don't know what's in it. They're just burying it in the hopes that it never gets back. And as Wes said, they're very, you know, very well qualified, highly quite qualified scientists are they're saying that it inevitably will get back into the water supply, inevitably. And even an EP, the guy that was in charge of EPA's class two program said publicly, not you know, a month ago, that it was inevitable these class two wells would, would leak. So we're poisoning not only the atmosphere, but the earth we live on for something that has infinitely less value than water. You know, as W.H. Auden, a poet, could damn well tell you. <laughs> so that's what we're looking at, is, you know, a massive, massive use of water. You know, we use about seven million acre feet on the Front Range uh, between the Platte and the Arkansas. I think it's about five million on the Platte and two million on the Arkansas. Uh, 
But that water is used over and over and over again. You know, we all, because we you know, use water on our lawns, we all use about 50%. But that 50% gets back in the systems used again, and triples down and triples down, and each time you cut it in half. Not with, not with fracking. Those guys take it all, and it can't get back into our system. So it, it's, this whole thing cries for a major evaluation before we get any further. I mean, it's insanity to continue to lease and lease and lease. The federal and state lands are set up for lease every quarter. And we're not tracking as close as we were. We have enough information to make us blink. But it's about 100,000 acres every quarter. And it, they keep going on and on and on. And yet on the federal land, for instance, only 30% of it is in production. Why are we leasing more land when what they already own or lease isn't even in production? And they lease it for nothing, $2.50 an acre for 10 years. And trust me, the owner of the mineral right has superior rights to the surface owner. If you're a su surface owner, you just bought the farm. I mean, most of these urban people never even considered that they would have a fire belching, smoke uh, belching thing in their backyard. But that's the prospect. And you can't get the attention of those people down in Washington for sure, but not even in our state legislature. Because it's been in the country so far, but it's moving ever closer to the cities, ever closer to urban areas, and these people have no control on their appetite. I mean, they just, they're too far out on the money train, they're gonna fall off one of these days, but we have to make sure that it happens to them. There just isn't enough water for these people. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't want the rivers that I fish to be dried up so that somebody can drive a Hummer around. It just makes no sense to me. It just, it, there's no sense in this. We need to stop them. We need to tell them that this is a massive industrialization, the consequences of which we simply do not understand, and it's time for the people we elect to become responsible and say, let's stop, let's find out what we're doing to ourselves, and then we'll go from there. But they don't have to use water, incidentally, to frack. They use water because it's cheapest. And they're not even, you know, you and I, if, if, you know, if we want to develop a farm, we have to have a water right. We have to go into water court to get that water. And there has to be water available. They're not doing that. They're going into the cities and buying surplus water and applying it out there in the, in the oil patch. You and I couldn't get away with that. Not on the scale they're doing it. No way. And it shouldn't be allowed. I mean, they should, you know, if you're going to have a housing development, you have to be able to demonstrate that you've got a water supply. They don't have to do that. All they have to do is get the bid at 250 an acre from the state or the feds, and away they go. So uh, I'll end there, and, and Wes and I'll take uh, questions. Thank you for your attention.